All right, everyone, thanks for joining. We're gonna get started here. So it's a pleasure to, to have Nina Lu from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. And she's going to be talking to us about some uh, quantum learning, particularly in the context of the quantum internet. Please take it away. Uh, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for inviting me. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here and, and good morning. Uh, so, so this morning, I'd like to share with you some work in an area called adversarial quantum learning. And you know, from the title, you can already guess that you know it's something at the interface between security questions and learning problems with quantum resources. And this is really motivated by asking, you know, what happens if we start deploying machine learning algorithms, which can be aided by quantum resources in an internet setting? And in such a setting, they would be subject to security violations. Uh, and because this is you know a bit interdisciplinary, uh, I'll, what I try and do, I try to assume no knowledge uh, at all on the classical side of things, you know, either you know machine learning or adversarial machine learning, because I assume most of you guys coming from the the quantum uh, side of things. And I'm just trying to introduce uh, first of all the very basic notions necessary to understand you know some of the developments in this area, and in particular in the second part of the talk to introduce two new uh, works. Uh, where we try to take the first steps in addressing uh, some key questions. You know, what are the general vulnerabilities of machine learning algorithms uh, that uses quantum devices? Uh, so vulnerabilities to adversarial attacks. And if there are more general methods of protecting these algorithms. Uh, and again, like Chris said, uh, please, because I, I actually can't see you. <laughs> so I don't know if you, uh, if you have any questions, whatever, please just unmute and just interrupt me uh, at any point. If anything's unclear. Okay, so what are the motivations for these questions? Uh, well, I got started thinking about these because I'm very interested to know what are the things we can do on a future quantum internet. So, you know, uh, what is a future quantum internet? So think about the classical internet as, you know, classical devices connected to each other with classical communication channels. And a quantum internet are just quantum devices, so, um, you know, either quantum computers or um, less universal devices connected by quantum communication channels. And of course, there, there are so many possibilities of questions you can ask in this setting. And I think, you know, Simon uh, Devitt, who already talked about some of these uh, things a little while ago in the seminar series. Uh, but for us, our question is, there, there are so many possibilities. So, you know, how can we start narrowing things down? Well, uh, well, the first way of narrowing things down is one notices is really a great deal um, that a network setting uh, has in common with machine learning. So the first aspect is security. So you know, as, as soon as you have more than one uh, party, you're going to have security issues in a, in a network setting. And machine learning algorithms has been used uh, for security purposes. So think about you know, spam, spam filters or fraud detection. Uh, and, and also there are security vulnerabilities of machine learning algorithms themselves. So that's actually an area or all you know, encompassed under the area of adversarial machine learning. This is something I'll go on um, a little bit uh, later on. Uh, and secondly, you know, they're both naturally distributed, uh, you know, problems. Uh, so for the internet setting, that's, that's quite obvious. But in real life deployment of machine learning algorithms, uh, you know, the data that you're usually working with, they often can come from, you know, different geographical regions. Okay, so, so think about, you know, the data that you might collect from, you know, sensor networks or, you know, maybe different hospitals that uh, the data you want to collect uh, and you perform your machine learning algorithms on. Uh, and thirdly, the motivation for network settings in distributed computing, you know, is de really dealing with big data. You know, why is it that, you know, we want network settings if, you know, a centralized, uh, you know, computer cannot deal with so much data. And some of the key motivations for machine learning using quantum algorithms, uh, you know, has been, uh, you know, to deal with a lot of this big data. Uh, not all proposals, but uh, many of them are. So, so here, uh, you know, there are really lots of things to explore at this interface, but for this morning, we'll focus uh, on the security aspect uh, of these questions. Uh, and, and actually, for, uh, this is an interesting question for, for UTS, like as well. So, so Peter Rudy, Simon Devitt, me, and a few other collaborators. Um, so uh, we're gonna, you know, put a book about the quantum internet, where we'll actually be discussing some of these key questions, right? So, so including this adversarial um, quantum learning. So, so what is this area of uh, adversarial quantum learning? Well, it's, it's right at this junction between you know, these questions about security, quantum information, and machine learning. Uh, and but why do we expect this area to be fruitful? Well, if you look at you know, the connections uh, between you know, the uh, different components of this Venn diagram, we see okay, that there is uh, a very traditionally you know, fruitful connection between quantum information security. 
So that, you know, the first viable quantum technologies were actually developed in quantum cryptography. Uh, and there are also you know, other protocols, you know, secure daily quantum computing, secret sharing, anonymous broadcasting, and a whole host of other security protocols. Uh, and then there's, you know, uh, you know, relatively new area, you know, that emerges between uh, quantum information and machine learning. So, so many recent developments, you know, either you know, use machine learning for quantum problems or uh, try to solve classical learning problems using quantum devices. So, you know, like quantum enhanced machine learning. And, you know, collectively, uh, these problems are called uh, quantum machine learning. And, uh, and thirdly, there's really a very large overlap between security and machine learning problems. It's an extremely vibrant field that uh, focuses either on using machine learning uh, to enhance uh, security uh, or uh, something that's becoming much more popular recently, uh, looking at security vulnerabilities and machine learning algorithms themselves. Uh, so, and, in, and we come up with problems like adversarial examples. And this is something we'll look more closely into uh, for the rest of this morning. Uh, and, you know, uh, like for all these problems, they're all under this umbrella term of adversarial machine learning. Uh, and so adversarial quantum learning is, you know, any problem that we say, you know, kind of lies uh, in the center of this diagram. Uh, and we can really consider the adversarial case as a worst case noisy scenario. So, uh, you know, it may not be in a security setting, but so long as you're in a scenario where you have no access to any of your noise models, the adversarial bands that you have, it will really provide you the worst case band. So you can also think about it that way. Well, uh, again, you know, we see well, there are really a lot of possibilities um, for questions in the center of this diagram. So where do we start? Uh, so one big motivation I had when I was thinking about this is noticing how many quantum algorithms uh, and also many quantum algorithms for machine learning, they rely quite heavily on having, motiv uh, having speed ups as motivation. But, you know, after being in the computer science department for a while and, and, and sort of asking around, uh, you know, there are a lot of classical machine learning people who are not that particularly interested actually in, in speeding up the computation. Well, it's, it's not really their main bottleneck. Uh, and they have other concerns, and in particular uh, concerns with security. Uh, and then, so, so then the natural question for a quantum person is to ask, you know, is it possible for quantum resources to help with security advantages uh, in machine learning algorithms aided by quantum resources? You know, uh, and, you know, in the same way that, you know, quantum resources has, you know, helped in the area of cryptography. Uh, and, and this, you know, general motivation then leads to two other questions. So naturally it leads to, you know, you're asking how vulnerable are machine learning algorithms, uh, first of all, to adversaries. So, so we know, um, uh, you know, you know uh, to what extent we need to protect these algorithms. And secondly, you know, once we know its general vulnerability, you know, what are the general methods we can do to make them more robust against adversaries? And we'll show later how we can actually use noise or exploit noise to, to help in this case. And this will be the main content that we'll be talking about. But before we go on into these questions, adversarial quantum learning, well, what is classical <laughs> um, adversarial machine learning? Right, and, and, and before that, I mean, I, I promised, I, I assume no knowledge about any of this classical stuff. So I'll try and begin at the beginning. What is machine learning, firstly? So, so machine learning is a basic response to the question of how computers can learn without being explicitly programmed. Uh, and the two main classes of problems that uh, it, uh, it can solve. So there are classification problems. So, you know, given a particular example, you want your computer to output for you a label uh, for this example selected from just some discrete finite set. So I think about, you know, is this a picture of an airplane or a cat or, or a dog? Uh, and then there's a continuous version of that problem. So they're called regression problems. And where these, you know, labels, they can take on continuous values. So think about, um, you know, finding the line of best fit in your data. Right, so, but for our particular application, we'll just focus on uh, classification. And the three main approaches, so they're, uh, so, so generally three, I mean, they're um, sort of techniques kind of in, the, uh, in between uh, these categories, but generally there are three. So there's a supervised setting where, you know, you're given training uh, examples, so your computer can learn from uh, previous examples, you know, unsupervised, where you have no training examples and reinforcement learning. Uh, so this is uh, you know, a newer uh, type of learning. So we have an interaction with the environment. But if, uh, for our case, we just look at the supervised uh, for simplicity. And, uh, and here I just try and explain pictorially uh, what, uh, you know, how, how we do this learning and you know, how we do this uh, testing. So uh, here, let's say we want to distinguish uh, between pictures of ants and cicadas. 
So uh, each picture can be represented by a vector in multidimensional space. So something we can uh, we call feature space. Uh, for example, if we assign each pixel uh, in our picture with, with one dimension and the length along this dimension, for example, can be the color of the pixel. So then you know, each uh, unique picture has its own uh, unique vector. Right? So, and what's important about those training examples is that there you're given labels uh, because you know okay, that, that these are pictures of ants. So we have labeled pictures of ants and also labeled pictures of cicadas. Okay, and part of the uh, learning part is to find some kind of separation between these groups of data. So for example, if you assume a straight line to separate them, then you want you know, a line that somehow maximally separates the, the data. So for example, you know, this line doesn't work uh, you know, as well as, as this line. Okay? Uh, but it doesn't have to be a straight line. You can use a different uh, learning model uh, so in this case, you can have a curly uh, line. So it can be some polynomial of a particular degree, uh, but uh, but generally uh, you can use a straight line. So uh, in and then the uh, after you've decided on your line uh, and where it is, the the testing process comes in, right? So meaning that if we have a new data point, uh, in, uh, and the question becomes, you know, is this new data point uh, a picture of an ant or a cicada? And you're asking, does it lie to the left or right of this line? Uh, so, so this is you know, a particular pictorial example, but we can think about you know, these class of problems more generally. So we can design circuits to perform uh, these training and testing procedures. And we can assume that uh, uh, for now that the classifier is some kind of black box. So, so we feed in the input state, you know, it can be a picture of a cicada, uh, and the outputs are true probabilities. So the probability that the picture is an ant and the probability that it's a cicada. Uh, and different machine learning algorithms are essentially different ways of realizing this black box, right? And there are lots of different models are available. So for example, you know, one way of realizing this black box could be, you know, something called a neural network. Um, and, and here, just think about uh, just this black box with uh, uh, a lot of tunable parameters. And we want to choose suitable parameters so that we can best distinguish, you know, um, between ants and cicadas in a similar way to how we could, you know, have freely moved the position of our straight uh, dividing line until we get some optimal, you know, separation line. But except here, we generally have many more uh, tunable parameters. Okay. And, and then you can have quantum versions of this. So, so whether input can be quantum um, or classical uh, or the uh, black box, the quantum circuit to realize the classifier itself uh, can also be quantum. Right. So, so we have examples of, uh, you know, a quantum circuit for binary classification. Um, where we measure a single qubit in the end. And here we have the probability of two measurement outcomes if we measure a single qubit. And this can correspond to the probability of you either being you know, an ant or a cicada. Right? So the exact details are really not so important so far, but the general picture I want you to have is just, uh, it's just some black box, right? And, and then we have some circuit to represent this black box. Okay, so, so now in these, uh, in these adversarial settings, you know, how can we start attacking these algorithms? Again, there are lots of possibilities, though, right? Because the basic process in machine learning we can think about as, um, as the following. So we start off with some raw data, uh, you know, and either we can feed our raw data into our classifier, you know, directly, or we can, you know, first extract some features and do some data processing. Uh, then we can assign our learning algorithm, uh, then we assign the model and train our algorithm. And then at the, at the end, we, uh, it's a testing procedure. So this is our prediction, you know, whether or not our, our new picture is an ant or a cicada. But of course, attacks uh, from adversary can come really at any stage uh, you know, in, this, in this machine learning framework. And the, uh, the attacks can either be quantum or classical, and each point in this procedure, uh, it can actually be quantum or classical. So you already see, just from a combinatoric <laughs> point of view, you know, how many possibilities there are. Uh, and, and also, uh, you know, the attacks can come you know, either during training time, right? So, uh, you know, the, the point where you decide where this div, uh, dividing line is, or during testing time. So once you've decided, um, and then you have a new example, you decide if it's to the left or right of that line. Uh, but for the purpose of, of this talk, we'll actually be focusing on just a, a type of testing time attack. And I'll describe the problem a little bit later. But first, uh, in general, uh, we like to know what are the classes of all possible problems you can have. And we can really, uh, you know, separate these class of attacks into three categories. Uh, so first is the adversary's uh, timing. Uh, secondly, the amount of information that is accessible to, to the adversary. And thirdly, the, the goal of the adversary. So for the timing, um, 
type before I mentioned, it can either be during the training time, so this is also called a poisoning attack, or during the testing time, so often called an innovation attack. Uh, but also depends on the amount of information you know about the classifier. So, uh, so we saw, um, you know, if it's completely black box, it means we really know nothing about it. We don't really know, uh, we might only know what's at the input and at the output. Uh, it could be something called a white box. So we know exactly what makes up this classifier, or it can be a gray box, you know, somewhere in between. Uh, and there are three types of goals that the attacker might have in mind. So the adversary can either uh, want to deliberately induce a specific type of misclassification. So this is a targeted, uh, targeted attack, or they might want to uh, reduce the reliability of the algorithm. Or simply, they just want to extract our information about the classifier. So this is more like an eavesdropping uh, type of attack that we're more familiar with in cryptography. Uh, and, and now I want to get to a very important problem in these type of attacks. And this is called um, adversarial examples. And this is a testing time attack uh, where we have the following example. So uh, neural networks or classifiers are known to be you know, very, very good at image classification. Uh, however, it's been discovered to have uh, quite an important Achilles heel. So here it's actually possible to engineer uh, specific perturbations uh, that induce a misclassification. So if we look at this picture of, of a panda uh, on the left, so for, for, for neural classifier, this is like an easy problem, right? And, and it uh, generally does it uh, quite well. But if you add in uh, you know, noise you know, in quotation marks, because you know, it's something that looks, you know, might look like random noise, but it's not. It's specifically designed a perturbation uh, so that you end up with a picture that looks you know, exactly the same, uh, more or less, but now it's been misclassified as a given, right, with uh, quite high confidence. Uh, and, and here, this is called a white box attack because the, uh, the adversary knows something about the, the classifier, so it can maneuver the perturbation in this specific way. Uh, but you know, it doesn't have to be a white box attack. This actually also works for black box attacks. So if we look at the, the images on the top, uh, so these are the original pictures, and we have the original classifications on the bottom, and we see these are you know, correct classifications. Uh, but then we have adversarially perturbed images on the bottom, which you know, to us you know, visually look the same, uh, more or less, but then they're completely misclassified. And in fact, there are also uh, you know, attacks called single pixel attacks, where you're just changing you know, one pixel and you completely misclassified um, your pictures. Uh, but in fact, this is not just uh, an anomaly uh, um, that you know, only occurs for specific types of data or specific type of models. This is actually a very generic behavior that has been found you know, across classification models and, and data sets as a generic feature of, of neural networks. And it's not even uh, just for images, you know, uh, you know, for audio data, you, know, um, you also have this problem. You know, so this on the bottom, we have a how are you, um, you know, with a bit of perturbations, and then it suddenly opened the door. Uh, and what about in the quantum setting? So there are also quantum machine learning algorithms uh, for classification where you know, we might want to classify different types of quantum data. You know, is, a, you know, is a quantum data, uh, is a quantum state entangled or not? You know, are we in a quantum phase transition? Um, and so does this mean we can also have you know, quantum adversarial examples? So, so now we finally get to uh, these questions of uh, adversarial quantum learning. So, and we can consider security vulnerabilities uh, of you know, quantum machine learning algorithms themselves, or we can think about uh, you know, what are the quantum machine learning algorithms that we can use to enhance security in the same way that classical machine learning algorithms have been used uh, in that capacity. So, so we had uh, some of these lovely guys in Barcelona, so, um, so Gael and John and Ramon uh, and others that came up first with these uh, quantum change point problems. So, so, so you, have a classic, uh, you have a quantum state preparation device that you know, outputs uh, quantum states you know, steadily, uh, identical quantum states. And at some point, it decides to change its state preparation. Okay? And, and the task is to identify at what point uh, this state, state, uh, state preparation device has changed uh, its settings. Uh, and uh, a, a little bit later on, there were works that try and you know, combine you know, ideas from uh, differential privacy. So this is something I'll describe a little bit later uh, with quantum computation. So not for learning problems, uh, in, uh, but for uh, you know, quantum algorithms more generally, right? How we, how we can define uh, these ideas of, of privacy. Uh, and then you know, thirdly, you know, there are quantum machine learning algorithms for uh, anomaly detection. So detecting uh, unusual features in data. 
Uh, but then, you know, on the other side, we also have the vulnerability of uh, quantum machine learning algorithms. So as far as I know, uh, so this work by uh, Nathan Weeb and uh, Ram Kumar, so, so, so they were looking uh, at particular algorithms like, you know, principal component analysis and k-means clustering uh, and finding more robust versions uh, of these. Okay, so I think Nathan is actually talking here next week. Um, and uh, my collaborator, uh, Dong Ling in Tsinghua, so, uh, so he's been looking at uh, quantum, uh, quantum adversarial examples in machine learning, uh, uh, different phases of matter, uh, and also for image recognition. Okay, so, but for a lot of these uh, works, you know, there, you know, when you look at the vulnerability, the security vulnerabilities of these algorithms, uh, they're quite specific. You know, they're, yeah, it's more like, you know, you choose a particular uh, algorithm and you're trying to find more robust versions of that particular algorithm. Uh, and this is uh, a trend uh, th that was uh, quite prevalent in, in machine learning, uh, where, you know, th this week someone, you know, came up with a more robust version of a particular machine learning algorithm and the following week someone came up with, you know, a counterattacks. Okay, so, so it's a bit of a cat and mouse uh, type of game. So, so then our question is, you know, can we step back a little bit and ask, you know, are there general bounds that we can find for these problems on adversarial examples and not just these particular types of algorithms uh, and scenarios. And then, you know, maybe that would, you know, lend more insight perhaps on the differences between uh, classical and, and quantum. Uh, and then this leads to two basic questions. Like firstly, uh, can we say something about the robustness of general quantum classifiers against these type of adversaries? And uh, secondly, you know, once we know these, are there any ways of improving this robustness in a more general way or a more natural way. Uh, and my, by more natural, more general, meaning uh, there are techniques which uh, we can readily use and also without resorting to particular details about the learning models. Because what we don't want is to think of, you know, a completely different method for every different um, uh, machine learning algorithm. Okay, so, uh, so, and for today's, you know, adversarial learning setup, you know, we have the simplest type of, you know, network, right? So we just have two parties, you know, Alice and Bob. Uh, and for this you know, adversarial example setting, we have you know, Alice, who, uh, she's, and she's the one performing the algorithm. Okay, so you think about you know, maybe she has access to a quantum device performing classification. Uh, and Bob is the one sending Alice uh, test examples. So, so these you know, may, may be new pictures that uh, you know, he wants Alice to classify. And, and the problem is you know, what happens when you know, Bob doesn't behave as expected or there is some you know, evil Eve who comes in and uh, you know, adversarially perturbs Bob's example. Okay. Uh, so, so now we up to the second part of the talk. We'll actually talk about uh, you know in this particular scenario. Uh, you know, we address the two questions. You know, how what is the robustness of a quantum uh, classifier against you know adversaries to Bob's uh, test examples? Uh, and secondly, uh, can we improve this robustness in a natural way? And we'll show how you know noise can help us do that. Right. Do, do we have any questions, by the way, uh, before I go on to, to the second part? A any quick, any quick questions? No. Okay. Um, so, so for the first part, you know, what is the general robustness of quantum classifiers against adversaries? So, so I'll, I'll try and motivate this uh, pictorially first. So, we, so we saw, uh, you know, this particular example already. Uh, you know, telling difference between ants and cicadas, and we have some dividing line. Uh, and then this orange point here is some, um, you know, new uh, testing example. And we see that it's you know slightly to the right of this line. So uh, so if you have an adversary, what would you do? Okay. So you, what you would do is uh, uh, you would you know push it slightly you know across this uh, dividing line. Uh, but but of course, if you were really really far, if the original example is really far from the dividing line, uh, you know it doesn't matter which direction you you know you push. You're never going to um, you know induce a misclassification. So, so then this gives us an idea, actually, uh, you know, your ability to, to find adversarial example, meaning, you know, a small perturbation that induces a misclassification, it really depends on the concentration of points that you have near these decision boundaries. So if you're very, very close, then, you know, generally you can always find an adversarial example, but whereas, you know, you're not likely to if you're further away. Uh, so, so here is an example. I suppose that we want to classify the points, you know, uh, on the surface of this ball. And for, uh, you know, machine learning algorithms, there's always are some, you know, set of uh, points which, you know, originally, uh, you know, misclassified. Right. So this is not the same as empirical error. This is just the original probability misclassification is always there because uh, the classifier is never perfect. 
Okay. Um, so, and here we just call this class our M. Uh, and a mu of M, we say this is a probability of you misclassifying. Uh, and here, you know, I just drew it as, you know, a single uh, green blob, but in general, you know, it's, it's really dotted, you know, throughout uh, or the space of states that you want to classify. And now we want to introduce this concept of uh, epsilon adversaries. So, so suppose we want to classify this red point here. So if now if you're an adversary, uh, in order to induce a misclassification, you, you need to push this red point, you know, towards this green point. And here, uh, you just need to move by the amount epsilon. Yeah, so, so in this case, uh, this will be called an epsilon uh, adversary. Uh, so, uh, and this epsilon is the closest distance between uh, your test data point and your set of misclassified states. Uh, and now this, you know, this picture gives us a hint on how we approach our problem. Because now we want to ask, you know, how does this epsilon then depend on the geometry and you know, dimension of the set of data that we want to classify? All right, so, you know, because this, this epsilon is essentially, uh, you know, the size of the adversary. And, and here, uh, you know, we, we have access to uh, this mathematical notion of concentration functions. So, so, so before we uh, talk about the concentration function, uh, we first define something called an epsilon expansion of M. So, so here with this green blob, this is the original set of misclassified points. And now for each point on the boundary, uh, of, of, of this screen cloud, uh, we push outwards by the amount epsilon, right? And this is called the epsilon expansion of M. Uh, and essentially the question about, you know, adversary we want to ask is what is the probability that the state that you want to classify lies within this epsilon uh, expansion? Because if you lie within this epsilon expansion, then it's always possible for an adversary to move by an amount you know, less or equal to epsilon uh, before uh, you induce a misclassification. Yeah, so, so now this becomes really a geometrical problem. You know, what is the size of this, you know, epsilon expansion? Yeah. And this is where uh, the, you know, concentration function helps us. So if the geometry that you're looking at, you know, belongs to uh, these Levy families, then the concentration function, you know, has this form on the right here. So Y minus alpha, that represents the probability that you actually land inside this epsilon, you know, expansion region. And if, uh, and if the space belonged to these Levy families, uh, and here D is the dimension, uh, so we notice as uh, dimension increases, then this one minus alpha factor becomes one very, very quickly. Uh, meaning that if the geometry belonged to these Levy families, as dimension increases, you're almost always gonna find yourself within this epsilon band. And it so happens that uh, SUD, so, so this uh, special unitary group of D uh, dimensions, it belongs to these class of geometries. And already you see, okay, well, you know, we can really represent um, the uh, classes of you know, pure quantum states, you know, as belonging to SUD. And if we were randomly selecting, uh, you know, from, from this space, then in high dimensions, we expect, you know, we're likely to fall within this epsilon band and therefore, uh, you know, having an adversarial example or a quantum adversarial example. So, so then we have our first theorem uh, where we say, well, suppose uh, sigma is some d-dimensional pure quantum state. So, so essentially think about this as selecting from SUD uh, and a perturbation, you know, sigma to rho occurs, right? Uh, and assume, you know, so, some distance. Uh, so the Hilbert-Schmidt distance between sigma and rho is below some epsilon. Now, if the adversarial risk is less than R, so adversarial risk is uh, the amount of misclassification you're uh, willing to tolerate, uh, then the epsilon uh, is less than this factor on the right. So I, I only want you guys to concentrate on one factor at a time. So, so here uh, we just concentrate on the factor with dimension. Okay. So, so this is really saying that as dimension increases, this epsilon becomes you know, smaller and smaller and smaller, uh, meaning as dimension increases, the, uh, the amount that an adversary needs to perturb your original state, uh, it, it can be smaller and smaller um, before it induces a misclassification. So it's much easier uh, to induce a misclassification in high dimensions. Okay. Uh, and just on a note here, that this doesn't extend uh, directly to CV states. Um, so, because there are only generally a finite number of parameters describing you know, general CV states. So it's not like as you know, dimension goes to infinity, um, this uh, likewise uh, means they're somehow much more vulnerable to adversaries. So that's not the case. Uh, and, and the second part, so this is something I won't uh, talk so much about, but I uh, just want to make a note in case people have questions later. Uh, and this factor on the right, this is uh, kind of a trade-off between you know, the risk 
uh, which is the uh, you know, amount of misclassification you're willing to tolerate with mu of m. So this is some, uh, somehow your original uh, external classification. And this is related to a particular form of the no free lunch theorem uh, in machine learning. Okay, so, so now what is our quantum you know, setup? So we have you know, our Alice and Bob setup where you know, Alice has access to her um, you know, whole device, but the input state sh that she has comes from Bob. Right? And, and therefore Bob, or you know, some evil Eve who's controlling Bob's state, you know, has the capacity to change uh, the state from sigma to rho. And supposing we wanted to perform uh, uh, a machine learning algorithm of quantum device for, for classical states. So meaning that you know, Bob uh, is really doing the state preparation, is really doing the quantum state preparation for, for some classical states. Okay. And, and then you know, some adversary is now uh, changing the sigma to root. So then we have you know, sort of a, a second result, which is the verification theorem for adversarial quantum learning. So if, uh, if Alice wants to test if uh, a perturbation in the state has occurred or not, uh, she needs to perform some certification test on sigma. Uh, uh, if she wants to perform a certification test with some failure probability beta, then she needs to know how many copies uh, of her uh, she requires. Uh, and here we see, so the only thing I want, you, uh, the factors I want you to notice is this d to the four uh, on the top. Okay, so, so, so we happen to know that for, um, for certification problems, uh, that the, that unlike uh, state tomography, we actually don't need an exponential amount of resources. You know, like an order log d uh, is enough. And here, uh, yet we still get a, a polynomial uh, dependence on dimension, right? So, so somehow uh, this is worse than uh, tomography. Uh, this is just as bad as tomography somehow. Uh, and why? Why is that? Well, uh, because for uh, most of these certification uh, protocols, you actually assume that the error to which you need to certify uh, the state uh, doesn't change. So, so, so if you need to know uh, the state to some error uh, eta, then this is something that's constant. Uh, however, uh, what's special about these adversarial examples is that because we saw how the epsilon uh, becomes smaller and smaller as dimension increases, and therefore the amount of precision that we want uh, for these states, uh, or to certify these states for, as we go to high dimensions, that increases. So, so this is how we actually get these um, our D factors here. Uh, and so this is actually suggesting there is a certain tension now that develops between the resources required to, to ensure this robustness against misclass misclassification, so this particular method of certification, uh, and there are quantum advantages expected as dimension grows, because a lot of these uh, quantum machine learning algorithms, they're claiming uh, these speed of advantages with respect to you know, the size of the data. Um, you know, how, uh, how high uh, this dimension D is. Okay, so, so then you're saying, you know, if this is tension developing, is it really worth, uh, is it really worth doing, right? Because, you know, somehow, it, even if you have exponential, you know, quantum advantage with respect to dimension, you, some, you have to pay it back now with um, doing certification. However, it's, it's, it's not all that bad, um, because here, you know, even though this is a very general, um, you know, robustness result, uh, it's not it's not all that bad because we actually assumed uh, some, uh, we actually assumed that we were selecting our states ha randomly from SUD right because you know we had this purely geometrical picture and I'm just saying like if, if our you know state is randomly selected from SUD uh, you know then we can use these concentration uh, theorem results but in reality that's not actually what happens I mean you know for any classification problem you're very rarely just randomly selecting. Um, you're always, you know, selecting with, uh, with respect to some, you know, prior probability distribution. In albeit maybe probability distributions you don't have a good description of, but it's always some restricted probability distribution. So, so here, you know, we try and see what happens when we, you know, restrict this high random uh, selection assumption. So instead of selecting, you know, everywhere, um, you know, in this SUD, so, so this sphere is supposed to represent SUD, uh, what if we only selected some fraction, you know, k of the states within this SUD, you know, so, so these, you know, yellow blobs over here. Uh, and then, so the sigma states, they're kind of randomly selected from, uh, you know, these fraction uh, of states in SUD. Uh, and then uh, we will have more generalized uh, theorem for, for adversarial quantum learning. So all the other statements remain the same. So, so suppose we're selecting, uh, you know, sigma is a d-dimensional pure state from a fraction k of all, you know, possible d-dimensional pure states. 
Uh, and in that case, we actually see there is, um, you know, every other expression remains the same, uh, even the dimensional dependence. But now we have the fraction k um, uh, here on the right here, right? So before k is equal to one, but now we have uh, r over k. And what are the implications for that? So the implications are that if we, you know, choose uh, k to depend on dimension in some way, Okay, so, so for example, here if uh, you know, k is proportional to one over one minus e to the power of minus d, uh, then actually you know, this would cancel the our entire dimensional dependence that we have uh, in this robustness expression. Right, so, and, and what this means is that you know, as dimension increases, uh, as, as we have you know, uh, you know, smaller and smaller fractional states that we're looking at, then we actually have better and better uh, a dependence on dimensionality, meaning we become less vulnerable to adversaries in high dimensions if we're really looking at, you know, a more restricted set of states. Uh, so an example, if we're only looking at, say, you know, low entanglement uh, quantum states, you know, as we would do in a lot of, you know, natural uh, quantum problems, then, uh, then we're not looking at the entire SUD, but, you know, a very small fraction uh, of SUD. So, uh, and, and here, uh, this is something I would like to uh, kind of think more about, but, but at the moment, you know, it's kind of hinting, you know, if there is really a fundamental uh, trade-off now between our security advantages and knowledge about the state, because as you're restricting your, uh, the type of possible states, you're actually given more knowledge uh, about the states uh, that you have. And, and this is somehow trading off with um, the adversarial vulnerability. Okay, so, so now we get to, to the second question. Uh, so now we actually saw what uh, the robustness band is. So can we improve this robustness in any way? Okay, so, um, so here we actually see, well, uh, or the claim is that we can actually make these quantum uh, classification algorithms more robust by adding in noise. Uh, so this is something that's done with some of these UT, uh, UTS guys. So uh, Minxian and Yuxian is one of Minxian's students. Uh, who came to visit me in Shanghai for, for an extended period. I, I think he's still here. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Dachin and Tom Young, they're both at the University of Sydney. So these are the classical computer scientist, uh, scientists. So we make sure that we want you to do the classical parts properly. Uh, and, and the general uh, sort of flow of uh, these arguments goes as the following. So we're saying that noise somehow uh, provides uh, randomization. And randomization gives rise to a property called differential privacy. This is something I'll go into a little bit later. And then differential privacy then gives rise to uh, robustness. So, and the key results that we have uh, that I'll talk about is what we find is that depolarization noise in quantum classification algorithms that can actually help uh, to protect the privacy of the inputs to a quantum classification algorithm. Uh, and then the protection of privacy actually helps with taming this adversarial behavior and then through that, uh, you know, proposing, you know, a new uh, figure of merit for quantum advantage in quantum machine learning algorithms. So, you know, the, you know, the, the first motivation is trying to get away from this, you know, speed up centric way of thinking about quantum advantage. Um, so, so can we, you know, think about a security advantage, like in this case. All right, so, so first let me talk about this concept of differential privacy, like firstly in the classical case. Uh, so, 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 so before looking at this equation, I'll just try and explain in words, uh, you know, what, uh, what this privacy concept means. So there are a lot of different concepts of privacy and, th and this uh, differential privacy is only one particular uh, definition of what we mean by privacy. So, uh, and this naturally occurs in distributed settings. So suppose, uh, you know, we have some, you know, central server, say, you know, um, you know government, uh, who wants to collect data, you know, from the population. Uh, you know, it can be average height or, you know, some more sensitive medical data. Uh, and, uh, and they're performing, um, and they want to perform an algorithm in such a way that, uh, you know, the citizens are willing to send in their data so the government can, uh, you know, get all the uh, data that they want, but without exposing the uh, de details of individual data, right? So, and one way of achieving that is to say that the net result uh, of an algorithm that the government performs on, you know, the, the data set is actually not so dependent on the individual data. So that if someone decides to not send their data in, right, then this is not going to make a big difference to, to the net result. And, and, uh, and in this way, you're preserving the individual's privacy. 
So, so, so now just going to a little bit more mathematically. So, uh, if, so if we have a randomized algorithm, so this is like the government performing the algorithm and taking the inputs from uh, some data set, you know, um, and, and let's represent it by uh, a vector x. Okay. Uh, and now, you know, they have some, you know, a set of possible outputs. So, and they can belong to some, you know, set S. Um, but now someone decides not to send in their data. Right. So, so then the you know, net input data set uh, is now represented by X prime. Uh, and we want to say that the, the probability of getting the outputs, of getting possible outputs for, uh, if we had input X compared to X prime, that they don't defer by very much. Okay. So, so, so here, this not very much uh, is quantified by you know, E to the uh, power of epsilon, where epsilon is very small. So, you know, as we see, if epsilon approaches you know, zero, then you know, they're identical. So it doesn't matter at all if, if someone doesn't send in their data. But in general, this epsilon is, uh, you know, positive, but, but small quantity. And already you can, you know, uh, this should, you know, sound familiar uh, from, you know, when we talk about adversarial examples. Because here we're saying, look, it doesn't matter so much if someone doesn't send in their data. And somehow, if, if one person doesn't send in their data from a very large number of people, that's saying you're really changing your you know, entire data set by, by a small amount. Okay. And, and, and this you know, should remind you of adversarial examples, because you're saying you know, we, we have some initial state, we're perturbing by a little bit, um, and, and somehow, you know, if it doesn't matter to the end result, then uh, we don't induce misclassification. But if we uh, do induce misclassification, then it certainly means we don't have this, you know, differential privacy notion. So already here we see, you know, a connection between this notion of differential privacy and protection against adversaries. Uh, and we can also have quantum versions of these, right? So, so in the quantum version of these, we're saying uh, we have, you know, our original state, our sigma, uh, and say, uh, you know, it's, it's perturbed, you know, very slightly uh, into a state root. And now, you know, the, the special thing about, you know, quantum algorithms is that we don't need to, you know, randomize it, um, you know, artificially. It's, you know, automatically randomized because, you know, you automatically have probabilistic outputs. So, uh, so if, you know, a, a quantum you know, computer is represented by some quantum operation epsilon, then, uh, then we have a very similar expression to what we have to, to the classical definition of differential privacy. So on the left, we have the probability where the, uh, the output of our uh, quantum device you know, belongs to some set you know, SQ. And then if we perturb it, uh, if we perturb sigma by, uh, by a little bit, then we get rho. And we want to say that the, the probabilistic outputs they, uh, or probability distributions representing the outputs, they only differ by some small amount uh, represented by e to the power of epsilon, where epsilon is very small. And, and, by, and by very small perturbation of the states, uh, we're saying that the trace distance between sigma and rho, you know, they're upper bounded by some quantity uh, tau d. Okay, so, uh, and here we see how, you know, we don't need to add in randomization uh, to our existing algorithm to make, you know, this differentially, you know, private our definition. Because you know, for the quantum setting, somehow naturally fits into this because it's naturally uh, probabilistic. Uh, so, uh, and, and then you know, there's a lemma that um, that one can prove, where if we have a general quantum circuit, okay, so so this is our state sigma, uh, so this is a state that we might want to classify, and then we have our sum and still state. So it, um, you know, you can have it there, or you don't have, you need don't need to have it there, but this is just very general, and with some quantum operation. Or a, and then we're making some measurement output at the end. Okay, so for a classification uh, problem, so if for binary classification, this would be like a single qubit measurement, but you know, for high orders of classification, then you know, you might want to measure more qubits. But what we'll do is that we actually put a depolarization channel somewhere in our circuit. Okay, uh, and and now we want to ask, you know, uh, you know, can we uh, say that you know this type of circuit you know satisfies uh, this differentially private definition, uh, and if it does, you know, in what way it depends on you know the amount of depolarization noise that we put in, you know, because we we saw in you know the definition of differential privacy that somehow you know randomization uh, might be something that uh, actually improves your your epsilon, but of course in the classical case you actually need to you know artificially inject. Uh, these type of noises. In the quantum case, you automatically get this, but you know, maybe we can enhance this by adding in even more noise. And indeed, what we see is that the, the epsilon, so, so this is, again, you know, quantifying how differentially private you are. So the smaller the epsilon, the more differentially private. 
Uh, it depends on the quantity on the right. So, so D measure, so this uh, you can think about as the dimension uh, of the final state that you want to you want to measure. So for binary classification, so ant or cicada, only two possibilities, then D is equal to two. So, and, and this will be like fixed for your classification problem. RP is the amount of uh, you know, depolarization noise. So depolarization noise is just um, you know, a sum of you know, uh, a certain probability, one minus you know, P that you, know, you do nothing, and then you know, probability P that you actually um, are become a maximally mixed state. Okay, so, so larger the p, the more uh, uh, differentially, uh, the more depolarization noise you have. And then tau d is now the upper bound to the trace distance between sigma and rho. And here what we notice is that, you know, as our p starts to increase, then we actually have, you know, a lower epsilon. So indeed, we you know, we do get, uh, you know, more differential privacy as we, you know, suspected with more noise. And it, it's not even dependent on where we put the depolarization noise. So we could put it at the end, we could put it at the beginning and we can put it you know, anywhere kind of in between as well. Okay. Uh, and, and this you know, expression, it still holds. Uh, yeah, and for example, you know, this, um, this circuit, it can be these you know, quantum neural network classifiers that we introduced at the beginning. But, you know, but it's sufficient for us to think about these as a black box. We actually don't need to know any more details about these. Okay, but then it's actually not enough <laughs> to say you have more differential privacy, right? Because, um, I mean, of course, if we go to the extreme limit of uh, a maximally mixed state, right, then of course we get complete privacy because, you know, everything is, you know, completely random, but then that's also not helpful. So, you know, while you get differential privacy, you also, um, you know, get a useless classifier. Uh, so what we want to make sure is that uh, we have a classifier which is both useful uh, and has differential privacy. And this is what's important about, you know, uh, this lemma, which says that if we actually add in the depolarization channel, then uh, in the case of, you know, infinite uh, sampling, the uh, predicted class label doesn't change. So for a binary classification setting, if your original picture was uh, an ant and it's been classified as an ant, uh, it doesn't matter how much depolarization noise you put. I mean, so long as you don't um, uh, put, uh, you know, uh, as long as, you know, you don't make it completely mixed, it doesn't matter, you know, how much depolarization noise you put in. So, if, so long as you sample infinite number of times at the end, then it doesn't change your class. It's still an end. Uh, but of course, in real life, we only have finite sampling. So then, what is the sample complexity to make sure that we're still within the same class to probability beta? Uh, the sampling complexity scales as the following. So, uh, so it scales as one over y minus p squared. And and what's what's nice about this is that it's now completely independent of the details of your input state. Like it doesn't depend on its dimension, okay? It only depends on how much noise you put in, right? So, so this is quite, quite a nice scaling. Uh, so, and, and this is then very good news because it's saying that for, uh, for classification problems uh, with depolarization noise, so long as you sample you know, enough times, but only with respect to the amount of noise, not with respect to the size of the data, you can always uh, get the same class label that you have. So, you, so it doesn't disturb the uh, accuracy, oh, it, it doesn't disturb the, um, the result of your classifier. Okay, so, so now we see, okay, so we, we, we get both our, um, the, the, the accuracy of our classifier as well as our differential privacy. So, so now we get uh, both of these uh, things that we wanted. And again, for this theorem, it actually doesn't matter where we put this depolarization noise, right? We can put it at the end or at the beginning or anywhere kind of dotted in between. So, so, so with this, we actually get uh, our theorem. So, uh, and the theorem says the following. So suppose we have a K-class classification problem. So for binary classification, that's K equals to two. Uh, and, and the output of that, again, you know, the probabilities that, that you know, we associate with uh, the state being a particular class. So, uh, and suppose the class label of sigma is zero. Uh, and then if we make an assumption about the, uh, the classes of states that we're looking at. So again, so here, this is not an SUD, you know, hard random selection of states. We're actually assuming that we're looking at states where uh, if it were the right classification, then we need to be quite sure of that. And, you know, the amount of quite sure is represented by, oops, is represented by our e to the power two epsilon. So, uh, so, so I'll just say it in words in, in particular example. So supposing, uh, you know, uh, for your state, Sigma, it can be like an ant picture. Um, and it has, you know, if we put it in our classifier, then, you know, the, the classifier outputs, you know, the ant with 
uh, probability like 70%. Okay. Uh, and then, and therefore a cicada with 30%. So therefore the separation between Y0 and the maximum of you know, YJ, that's you know, 0 0.7, you know, is larger than you know, 0 0.3. Uh, and, and this difference, this ratio, the difference between 0 0.7 and 0 0.3, that's represented by e to the power two epsilon. Uh, and so long as we ensure this type of condition, uh, we know that the, our classifier has this epsilon differential privacy property, right? Because we added in our noise, then you can show the classifier is robust against adversaries, where the uh, the uh, the the distance, the trace distance between sigma and rho is upper bounded by uh, tau d. So you know, in like the general message is that. You know, if we have a noisy uh, quantum circuit, which, which you know gives us a differential privacy, and we add in a little bit of an extra condition, uh, and this is enough to prove a robustness against adversaries. And so, and so what is this extra, extra condition? So this is something that takes us away from the SUD high random uh, condition. And more precisely, it's the separation between you know, the, uh, the probability of you getting this correct class uh, and the next highest probability. Uh, and, and here we have uh, some simulations. So, so Yushan did, did these uh, nice simulations on, uh, so we used a quantum neural network classifier with an Iris data set uh, just to like demonstrate some of these ad, uh, adversarial settings. So I'll, I'll just explain the little graph on the bottom. So in, uh, on the x-axis, we have the amount of depolarization. So this, this is the amount of depolarization noise that we inputted. And the, uh, the purple line is the amount of robustness. Okay. so. So, so here we see that you know, as the polarization noise increases, we actually get you know, quite a marked uh, increase in, in robustness. Uh, and, and this line on the bottom here, uh, this, these straight lines going down, this is the uh, test score. So, so this is the, uh, we can think about the probability that we assign that we actually get to the correct class. So, uh, and here, this is for a set number of samples that we take. So if we don't change the number of samples that we take uh, as we change the polarization uh, noise, then we see uh, the test score actually goes down. But of course, it always starts about 0 0.5 because again, you know, our theorem says in the infinite sampling limit, it doesn't change your classification. But, uh, but, if, but we can easily make this a straight line. So we're actually not changing the accuracy of the classifier, even as we increase noise, by simply increasing sample complexity. And we actually saw you know, what uh, sample complexity we need for that. Okay, so, so, so now comes the question, okay, so now all these are quantum results. Uh, so how does it compare with classical results, right? And you know, what advantages might uh, it have compared to classical? So, so here, let's just look at uh, a particular example uh, of you know, a noisy classical device, right? Where we use the same kind of mechanism. So, so here, uh, suppose, um, so, so for, for you guys who know about this, so uh, you know, uh, suppose the, a classifier is you know, a kernel classifier, and, and this is something we call a polynomial kernel, but, but otherwise don't worry about it. So when, uh, for the polynomial kernel, it just means that you know, for low n, where n equals to one, we're using a straight line, dividing line. But for higher n, then you know, the dividing line becomes more wriggly, right? So, so that, that, that's all you need to know. <laughs> um, and, and here, in order to induce differential privacy, um, you know, one of the main mechanisms is to use something called a plus noise. Uh, and we, now we want to know, uh, you know, how much the classifier is robust, you know, against these adversaries uh, for, for these different ends. Okay. Uh, so, and, and our theorem, so, so there's a lot of detail here, but the only thing I want you to notice is that, so L2, this is the L2 uh, norm uh, band for um, the robustness. You know, if we changed uh, the classical state, you know, X to, to X prime. But we see that this L2 is dependent on this one, or, uh, one over N factor. So, and remember this one, uh, one over n, this tells us, you know, how wriggly the line, the separation line uh, are, is that, that we want to separate our, our data with. Uh, so, so this is really saying that, you know, robustness, uh, but actually it's not just this example, but in general, actually, uh, the robustness results uh, depends on model parameters, right, um, that you decide. So in this particular example, like n, but, uh, so this is just illustrate a particular example, but this is uh, true in general, that it would depend on these parameters. Uh, but for the uh, quantum case, uh, we actually see that we lose uh, any of these dependents altogether. Okay, so so tau d is now the uh, is now the trace distance uh, between your know, sigma and rho. So this is the quantum version of like this L two, uh, 
uh, not in band. And here we see on the right, so B is just some constant, uh, but P is the amount of noise. And here we see that there's no dependence whatsoever on the, uh, like anything to do with the model. So, and again, anything to do with the model that will be encoded in, you know, the unitary or the quantum operation that makes up this quantum classifier. That to us is a black box, but here it depends on no details about this black box. And we can always uh, now compare that uh, in the, uh, to the classical setting by choosing particular encodings. So for example, if you happen to choose uh, amplitude encoding, so this is encoding your classical data into a quantum state, like in, in this particular way, where the you know, elements you know, of X are now um, the probability amplitudes, uh, then you know, our tau D would then be related to the L2 norm. And we see that you know, the result still holds, that you know, for, um, for the quantum case, you know, we, don't have this dependent, uh, we don't have this dependence on the model parameters, but with uh, the classical ones we do. So, so where does that actually come from? Because, so here we have a particular example, but it is true in general, uh, if we add in depolarization noise. So, it's, uh, so here, um, you know, because we, we thought about this a lot, because first it was, you know, quite mysterious. But then, you know, after thinking about it a lot, we um, found out actually it's, it's really quite uh, particular to this depolarization noise, right? Because we actually saw uh, for, you know, both our, our robustness result and also for the differential privacy result that actually it didn't really matter uh, where we put in this depolarization noise uh, in our quantum circuit, right? Uh, but whereas in the classical version uh, of this differential privacy, it really does um, you know, depend on where you actually put in your noise. So somehow the, um, it really, you know, it's something you know, quite special to, to these depolarization uh, noises. But of course, you know, in this particular analysis, it does. But later on, we actually are find you know, there are some other possibilities. But this is something I won't talk about uh, today. So, so in general, okay, so, so we saw, uh, so we started off with this idea, okay, so, you know, noise gives rise to randomization and, you know, randomization gives rise to this differential privacy property and this differential privacy property gives rise to, to robustness. Uh, you know, and then, you know, our theorem says, okay, so if you have a noisy quantum circuit plus this extra condition, it gives us robustness against adversaries. But somehow in our theorem here, we, um, the, the general picture is that simply we have a noisy quantum circuit. Okay, so, but whether or not it has this differential privacy, um, you know, it's, it's not very clear that it's, you know, absolutely necessary. Like, you know, is it possible to just jump from the randomization part into robustness? Uh, so, you know, so how important is this quantum differential privacy and can we have robustness with noise alone? Uh, and, you know, and can we have, you know, quantum robustness advantage from, you know, natural randomization outputs? So this is something that, you know, uh, you know quantum has sort of an advantage compared to classical in, in that it's, you know, naturally uh, randomized. Uh, so, so this is uh, a direction of future work. So I was hoping to get this uh, uh, sort of done before uh, talking to you guys today, but, but this is something that uh, will come out, uh, you know, relatively soon that we have some, some results like on that. But these are the more general questions that um, in, instead of now going by the route of differential privacy, is it possible to just say noise provides randomization, and now we want to restrict the hard random condition, and then, you know, from there we actually achieve robustness. Okay, so, so what are the main lessons today from adversarial quantum learning? So uh, I would say the take home messages are the following. Like firstly, a quantum, a quantum classifiers like you know, classical classifiers that are vulnerable to these adversaries and its vulnerability depends on dimension and the distribution also from uh, which we select the, these states to classify. Uh, and secondly, uh, we can see that noise can help in reducing this vulnerability and you know, it can be done in a way that is independent of the learning model. Uh, and, you know, there, there are many, you know, uh, questions for future investigation, okay, so, so looking more at, you know, this robustness between uh, quantum machine learning and, and also, you know, can we, uh, another motivation is, you know, can we use uh, the naturally occurring noise that we already have in quantum circuits? So that was one of the original motivations um, that, you know, uh, people are always looking at, you know, ways of, you know, getting rid of this noise in quantum devices, but, you know, are we able to utilize some of the existing noise uh, for, for good, right? So, so for robustness in this case. Uh, and also looking at uh, the connections between, you know, adversaries and, and random perturbations. Because, you know, in both the classical and quantum literature, um, you know, so far, somehow they're seen as very separate things. You know, the security aspect, you know, worst case scenario with noise. Uh, but, but actually, you know, by looking at this, we can actually see more of a continuum uh, between, uh, you know, adversarial perturbations and, and random perturbations. 
and, uh, uh, and again, so thank you so much to Chris for inviting me to, to these fantastic series. I mean, I only wish I could actually join you guys physically over there. Uh, and, and many thanks to my awesome collaborators, and in particular uh, in UTS, so, so Min students in UTS and Anu Shen's PhD students. Um, uh, and here, uh, these are the papers that I've been talking about today. All right, cool. Uh, thanks, guys. So, uh, questions? That's very cute. <laughs> yeah. uh, very good. Um, yeah, thank, thank you very much, Nana, for that talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I, I think I can probably read Hi. the chat. Hi. Uh, hello. Uh, hi, this is Nishti. Uh, I just have a question of uh, the misclassified uh, data points. Uh, mm -hmm. And you expand it by a, a, an epsilon, and then you try to find the point which is mis trying to be misclassified or try to be classified within the boundary of the epsilon. So, mm -hmm. uh, have you ever given a thought of uh, taking the misclassified data uh, set as a uh, uh, and uh, rotating to the misclassified data points? Uh, by using a QAOA algorithm and then measuring each point distance with an epsilon so that you can find whether the new point that is added is within that boundary or not. Of course, it will be uh, uh, inefficient uh, way of doing, but is that a possibility? Sorry, so, Nishikara, I'm, I'm not sure I understood your, your question. So, so are you uh, saying that um, so supposing that you find uh, that you have an adversary is a way of actually, uh, you know, undoing the work of the adversary using some kind of algorithm. Yeah. Is that the idea? Is that the basic? Yeah. Uh, extend yeah. the question. Um, yeah. Right. So, right. So it, it I, I would say it really depends. So, for example, uh, if you have access to uh, this new um, uh, this new state, but you have enough copies so that you're able to characterize uh, the state then you know exactly what the adversarial state is. Um, and, yeah. and, and in that kind of case, uh, it, it's, it's okay. So if you, if you knew like firstly what your original state is, right? And you have the characterization for, for the final state, then of course, uh, you know, you can always move it back. Um, uh, but- One question yeah. is particularly to using QAOA on the uh, misclassified points and then trying to find the adversaries using that uh, QAO and the epsilon difference. So I'm, I'm not sure what the significance of QAOA is in here. So, so, so uh, here you're, you basically, yeah. Now you basically put as a, uh, you put all the misclassified point as a for edges or vertices in a QAOA and then on, you rotate as it through to, to, to the data points and you find the differences whether it lies within the boundary of that epsilon. So, so, so maybe, maybe you're trying to ask, so let, let me just try and guess what you're asking because I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm yeah. still not very clear if this is what, what you're trying to ask. Um, that you, you maybe, you're, you're trying to ask if you want to find another, a different classifier uh, such that, uh, that you want to classify if an example is an adversarial example or not. Right, and you want to use QA mm -hmm. away from, is, is, is that what yeah. you're asking? Yeah, right, so, so yeah. this is like, like how do you, yeah, so, so this was actually um, something that was uh, looked at, I mean, not the QA away part, uh, but the question that was looked at in classical machine learning, you know, are adversarial examples somehow inherently different from other kind of perturbations? So if it is inherently different, then you can think about, you know, designing algorithms where, you know, you look for that type of thing. So, you know, for example, we have these like quantum anomaly detection, like type of algorithms. So these are like detecting unusual type of features. Um, but like coming from a lot of these classical works, um, so, so there's a lot of evidence showing that these are not somehow like very special, like, like they, they just, m maybe for like some particular classes, um, are, you know, they're, you know, that there's a particular direction in which, you know, you perturb and then, you know, these, you know, sets of states that would be misclass, uh, they would induce misclassification. Uh, so, so maybe I, I suspect for, uh, if you do find these, uh, like, uh, uh, classification type algorithms using QAOA or any other um, uh, type, 
uh, then uh, they, they might be quite like model dependent. So, so not like, you know, for, for general quantum classifiers, like telling the difference between, you know, okay. if you have these Aristotle examples or not, but, but that, that would be my suspicion. Thank you very much. Uh, Nana, there's a, a question in the chat. I can just read it aloud for you. Oh, okay, um, sorry, I, I didn't Elijah. see it. Okay. Um, question about noise uh, used in machine learning to improve performance out of sample. How would the use of noise in this context work when noise is added to improve classification? Um, so, sorry, so, so, so can I ask who asked this question? Do, do you mind just... Uh, like, yeah, I, sorry, like, sorry. What? Thanks, Chris, sorry. <laughs> I was on. <laughs> I know, yeah. Maybe it's Hi. easier. Hi. Hi. Yeah, so, so, so it was just a, and maybe the answer is obvious, but sometimes in certainly classical ML, one adds noise to improve the performance of your algorithm out of samples so on the test set. But I, you kind of touched on an answer already, which I suppose was... Uh, like if you're, you know, if you want your algorithm to, to classify the, if you want to improve the performance of your algorithm, mm -hmm. but uh, including noise um, on, you know, in your training data, for example, um, whether, whether there's, there's a, whether there's a way to sort of add that noise, but in some way also use noise in the way that you've been talking about without the, interfering with each other in some sense. And you sort of touched on that earlier with whether adversarial perturbations can be sort of classified as distinct from other perturbations. So um, that was just what I was, that was what was going through my head. So if you're using noise on purpose in order to improve the performance of the algorithm, um, the way to use the techniques that you're talking about in your papers um, to, to sort of not undo the beneficial impacts of noise that you had in training. Oh, right, yeah. So, so, yeah. so, so this was the, the first set of, uh, so, so let, let, let me make sure that I understood you correctly. So, mm. so, so you're saying, um, yeah, like normally when you add in noise, uh, like even though you might have other benefits, but actually you might be destroying, uh, you know, the, either the accuracy of the classifier or, or some, you know, more, uh, you know, beneficial, you know, parts of the classifier, right? Oh, uh, 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 yeah. one, the, there are cases where you add noise on purpose in order to improve the performance of the algorithm when you when you. Oh right, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was just wondering, like, if you add that noise because you want to improve the performance, and then you're like, oh, okay. but I want to use this technique, and I sort of need to use noise in a different way. Is there a right, is there so a tension there? Yeah. Oh yeah. So 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 in this particular case with depolarization noise. So so we were trying you know uh, different specific types of noise. With depolarization mm. noise, you would expect in a quantum setting it to actually make your algorithm worse, right? <laughs> like you like like so so th so that's not the type of noise that's mm. there to improve your algorithm. But uh, so so the good thing about that is to say well actually uh, with depolarization noise you don't um, uh, decrease the effectiveness of your algorithm. Like if you sample enough times. Mm. Mm. Um, but for but but actually another kind of motivation is that uh, you know you either can inject this noise artificially or actually what we were thinking originally is how do we exploit existing uh, noise like that's natural right because mm. you know in this kind of NISC era you know already have you know so much noise so uh, and you know with these error mitigation techniques you know uh, some of these are quite costly um, you know so is there a way of you know trying to minimize the resources for that you know by taking advantage of the noise that that we have so so that's um, but but I think that's a good question. I mean, is there mm. quantum, quantum noise that actually enhances rather than you know just diminishes? Because when we think about you know noise in the quantum setting, we're usually thinking about things that deteriorate um, your algorithm. And so this is something that we're thinking about, but we haven't actually found uh, a type of noise that does that. I mean, unless it's you know something that's very engineered and not and not very natural. Mm. Yeah, but yeah. Like, like I think that's a very yeah. good question. No, that is no, something thanks. that we're thinking about. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that question. Uh, I had uh, a question as well, Nana. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I guess more, maybe maybe more of a comment that that you might be able to comment on yourself. Um, so, when I see these like channels uh, where you have your algorithm and then um, and then the the error channel next to it, mm -hmm. uh, very reminiscent of um, like twirling procedures. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, in some sense, you don't even need to really talk about noise at all. If you imagine, like, say, 
each step of of the algorithm is is just um, you know conjugated by some some Clifford, then overall you'll get some twirling up um, effective twirling channel, and so the whole thing can be done like without you know like perfectly unitary, provided you know you you inject the randomness at the level of, of gate choices. Have you thought about that? Yeah, yeah. So I, I I think that's an excellent question. So this is something that we're thinking about. <laughs> Um, yeah, because I actually you're right. Like when I first saw it, that that really reminded me of twirling as well. So so the reason why um, so so we, we you know we didn't include that first is that when I uh, the the main motivation here is to use existing noise, right? R rather than saying that like, we want everything to be unitary uh, and then we like going along that kind of route. But I think uh, you know uh, later on when we you know start thinking about uh, you know different types of noise. And maybe more specifically, you know, engineer noise, maybe to like even enhance a performance in some way. Then, like in that kind of case, then we want to to think about like adding unitaries, like instead, and like selecting these random unitaries to do some kind of twirling. But I, I think that's yeah. So this is something that that definitely has crossed my mind, but I, I don't know how quite how to use it yet. Yeah, it's, I guess it's yeah. interesting because you were saying, well, you know, we have we have these devices that are that are already noisy. Can we use that? But also at the same time, I guess people are thinking about um, doing these randomization procedures uh, like already. So when we have mm -hmm. some sort of um, even some um, error corrected device, some large scale device, we'll be doing these uh, randomization procedures to turn any sort of um, mm -hmm. coherent noise into incoherent noise because those ones are easier to deal with in, when doing error correction. So in some sense, right. uh, whether it's there exists noise already or whether it's, you know, it, we're talking about fault tolerant devices, I think it, in either case, yeah, there'd be some, you know, there'd be some sort of intentional or existent um, mm -hmm. depolarizing noise happening. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I mean, I guess, like, in some sense, you can think about depolarization noise, like, in, in, like, within that setting as well, right? So, you know, there's a certain probability of applying, you know, like, nothing, um, and then, uh, like, the, uh, or you know, applying, you know, equally, you know, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z gates. Mm. So, yeah. Um, but this, this is something I'm happy to discuss later, actually, because it's something that's, that's in the back of my mind, but I'm not sure like exactly how to uh, deploy that, because at the moment, we just haven't been uh, need, needing that right now. But yeah, but you're right, like it, <laughs> like it's definitely uh, very reminiscent of, of things you can do with, with twirling. That's very interesting. Thank you very much yeah. for joining us. <laughs>